This is Mike with Snake Envy. So we have had some viewers actually request uh, videos with Jason and I individually where we talk about our journey in this hobby. And by the time you see this video posted, the, the video of Jason's journey will already have been posted as well. Uh, Jason, obviously, a lot of you knew going in when we created this channel who he was. A lot of you were familiar with Envy Reptiles. Uh, no one knows who I am, of course. And uh, so I think this will be fun to kind of introduce myself a little further and kind of tell you how my reptile journey began. Um, my earliest memories of reptiles and being fascinated by reptiles, it, it all starts in elementary school. And Las Vegas, Nevada. And across the street from our neighborhood, there was a vacant lot. And it was actually pretty large. It was at least a square city block. And it was mostly pristine desert, except for some concrete slabs that home builders and developers had dumped in that lot while they were building homes. But those concrete slabs provided good cover and basking spots and you know they actually kind of added to the environment for lizards that play, that vacant lot was crawling with lizards now elementary school age boys we had our bb guns we had this big vacant lot we would go into that vacant lot set up targets and we would practice with our bb guns one day while we're there we hear some splashing and obviously somebody's in a swimming pool bordering uh, that vacant lot and the na the that particular neighborhood was surrounded by a brick wall but there were decorative holes at a certain point in the wall so in in thinking about this it, it's like a movie scene picture a bunch of little boys lined up along this this brick wall some of us having to stand on something to uh, see through the holes in the wall our thinking was, because we, we lived in kind of a middle-class neighborhood, there weren't a lot of swimming pools. We used to go to the junior high and high school pools to swim in the summer. But our thinking was, oh man, if this is somebody from school and they have a pool, this is going to be great for us. So we wanted to find out whose pool that was. Well, imagine our surprise when we peer in through the, the brick and... It's two naked women skinny dipping in the swimming pool. So my journey in the reptile hobby actually begins with skinny dippers. Um, you're probably wondering, okay, what's the connection? Well, this was early in our uh, journey into that vacant lot. We'd only been over there a couple of times prior. We were old enough to understand that this was interesting, these naked bodies in the pool, but we weren't old enough to really fully understand why. And here's the kicker, the vacant lot and all the lizards in the vacant lot that we started to notice became much more appealing than the bodies in the pool. So that vacant lot took hold of us that summer. We were over there every opportunity we had. And I'm not proud to say, in the beginning, lizards that were too fast for us to catch became targets with our BB guns. But the very first time I ever shot one of those lizards with my BB gun, and I actually looked at it and held it, it was the first time we'd actually held one of them. I remember a lot of us being uh, disappointed that we had killed it because it was beautiful. It also, for these little elementary school age boys, reminded us of dinosaurs, its face, its colors, its feet and claws, and we were actually impressed. Our goal from that point forward was to try to catch them, and we saved our BB guns for tin cans and targets. But there were also desert tortoises in that vacant lot, believe it or not, and we used to see the desert tortoises occasionally in the neighborhood as well. And we found burrows in that uh, vacant lot that were obviously uh, dug by the tortoises. We didn't understand the connection between the tortoises and, and, the, and the totality of the ecosystem like I do now, but we were fascinated by all of it. Now, I have no idea 
to what degree the desert tortoises were endangered or protected back then. This was in the late 70s. Um, I ended up bringing a desert tortoise home and my parents were okay with keeping it in the backyard. So over the next two, three years, we actually kept this desert tortoise, something that's highly illegal today. They're very protected, uh, certainly wouldn't do this today. Um, but that tortoise lived in our backyard for about three years. Um, we fed it, we interacted with it. And for those of you that have tortoises or love tortoises, tortoises are amazing, amazing personalities. So for three years, he was basically a pet, he or she. Uh, and then he did what tortoises do, tunneled under the fence and we never saw him again. Um, but that was my first reptile that I ever kept, kept as a pet along with some of the lizards that gradually we, we started catching in that vacant lot. So I started catching wild lizards. We had that desert tortoise for a bit. I think particularly in that era of time, I think kids today grow up maybe being a little more uh, wary of not taking animals out of the wild. But back then, for a lot of us, that's how our reptile journey began. It began with wild caught you know, lizards and frogs, and, and in my case, it was lizards and a tortoise. Fast forward a few years, and my family had moved to the Houston, Texas area. We were living in Cyprus. And for those of you that don't know, and I often tell people out west, herping in the southeast part of the United States, and southeast Texas is a lot like uh, the rest of the southeast. Very dense forests bayous, creeks everywhere. Uh, the wildlife is plentiful. The wildlife is diverse, including reptiles and amphibians. You can go herping in the southeastern part of the United States, and it's actually pretty rare that you're going you're gonna to strike out. Out west, out here in the deserts and the mountains, it's a different story. We can go herping for hours out here in Utah and come up with nothing. Uh, and I often tell people out west, you know, it was amazing being in southeast Texas. It was brief. It was only for a couple of years. But that's where my attention turned to snakes because the snakes were plentiful. The snakes were big. We're talking coach whips. We're talking bull snakes. Uh, so we found as kids very, very large snakes. And... That's where my passion for snakes developed. I got to see them up close. We were always catching them. In fact, we were very stupid at times. We would catch copperheads. We would catch water moccasins. But I really got to see snakes up close, and I saw their beauty. And I became fascinated by the fact that these predators lack a lot of the tools of the trade for predators. They don't have the big claws. They don't have the big canine teeth. They don't have legs. Um, and I was amazed by that. And so I dug into every book I could find at the, at the school library. I, you know, I, we were all watching like uh, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom at that point in time. I was always extra excited if they were talking about snakes. So snakes became a real passion. I did with snakes what we used to do with lizards when we were smaller. And we used to catch snakes in the wild. We would bring them home. And we would just try to feed them. A lot of the fascination was just in seeing if we could get them to eat. And we were obviously fascinated by watching them eat. And then we would return them to the wild after a few weeks. Uh, occasionally we'd have one that we would keep for a couple months. And then we would return them to where we found them. And same thing, you know, for people of my generation in this hobby, uh, Jason and I are both in our early 50s, by the way. So growing up in the 70s and the 80s. That's how a lot of people's reptile journeys back then started. It was by keeping wild caught animals. The hobby back then wasn't what it is today. And finding captive bred animals and finding breeders. And it was a lot of work back then. Um, but that gradually led to the idea. Now, my parents, by the way, completely opposed to snakes being in the house. Uh, I still joke to this day that my parents have no idea how many snakes I kept. I figured out hiding spots in my room, under my bed, in my closet, and figured out how to keep a lot of things that they had no idea were ever in the house. But nonetheless, um, it would have to wait until after I moved out of the house that I could actually buy snakes and keep snakes on my own. 
The funny thing is, and I've joked on the channel before, that I wish I had discovered Pituophis as pets, gopher snakes, bull snakes, pine snakes, sooner. I've been keeping them for maybe the last seven years, and I wish I could say it was 20 or 25. But bull snakes and gopher snakes, every place we lived and on my grandparents' farm here in central Utah, you know, I can remember talking my grandfather out of killing a gopher snake that was in his chicken coop. Um, gophers and bulls were kind of that common snake that you saw a lot, and we used to catch a lot of them in the wild. We moved from Texas to the Denver, Colorado area, and that's, that's where I really consider home. That's where I grew up. That's where I spent most of my junior high, high school years, and where I lived for most of my adult life before moving to Utah. Um, and, you know, it was bull snakes on the golf course. It was, you know, bull snakes were everywhere in Colorado and Texas. And they just seemed common. What I thought was exotic and cool was like a California king snake. It was that iconic black and white color and the fact that they were rattlesnake eaters and so fascinated by them. So the first snake I ever purchased for myself was a California king. Now, I had three early mentors uh, and they were all in Texas. One was a pet, a pet store owner. Now he primarily had an aquarium store, a fish store. And me and several of my friends, we had freshwater aquariums. And so we would visit that store a lot. But that gentleman also had a few breeding pair of king snakes. So that was my introduction to king snakes. Uh, I don't recall us ever catching a king snake in Texas, to be honest. It was uh, coach whips and racers and bull snakes and um, garter snakes. And then, of course, our, our stupidity with the uh, copperheads and the water moccasins. But I don't recall a king snake. So he, that was kind of my introduction to king snakes was in his shop. He, he also sold reptile supplies, and he is the guy who taught us, you know, to buy an aquarium. He taught us how to build tops for the aquariums that would be secure, relatively secure. Uh, there was no such thing back then as a reptile enclosure. They didn't exist. You bought an aquarium, you had to build your own top out of wooden screen. He taught us how to weigh them down. He had a, he had a little clip system he used. So he taught us about setting up reptile enclosures and he sold uh, AstroTurf on a big roll. He sold it, he had a roll of AstroTurf, you'd cut it to fit your enclosure. Reptile mats they became known as later on, maybe some of you have seen them. Uh, the selling point for those reptile mats instead of substrate was that uh, you could just hose them off to clean them. Little little dish soap and, and the hose and you could clean off your uh, your reptile mat. Let's just say husbandry since the 70s and the 80s has come a long, long way. In fact, Jason and I were talking about it recently. Probably the most significant trend that we have seen in the hobby in our lifetime of keeping snakes is how much cooler we're keeping snakes over time. Uh, we, were, we were keeping them way too warm back then. Anyway, that's just a side note. I had two other important mentors. I had, um, it was a, a, a good friend of mine's brother who I found out at one point kept snakes. And this is when I was becoming more and more fascinated. So I got to see his setups. I got, I had the advice from the pet store owner. <clears throat> and then I learned later that a friend of a friend's stepfather bred snakes. And so I got to experience that as well. And coincidentally, he was also breeding king snakes and he was also breeding corn snakes at the time. And so I got to learn a little more from a breeder. And so those three mentors, and that's one of the other big differences in the hobby today. We rely on care sheets, we rely on the internet, we rely on videos like this. Back then, it was one-on-one -on -one mentoring. It was learning from people who were doing. The one lesson I learned from that mentor that I still apply today and that I, I still pass on to others that I have the opportunity to help is what he called observe and adjust. And it basically means that whether you're working from a care sheet or the internet or the advice of a friend, that's just a starting point. And then your snake's behavior, and it, it's different for every individual snake, tells you 
whether that snake is happy or not in its environment. And its behavior will give you clues as to whether you need to make adjustments to temperature or whatever it might be. I even had a snake recently that didn't like one of the hides. I thought it would look great to have two different hides in the, in the enclosure. And I noticed that she was never going into the warm one. Uh, I was gonna make temperature adjustments. And then I said, ah, just for, uh, before I go that far, let me just switch out this hide. I've got another one that matches the uh, other the other hide in the enclosure. And literally within a couple of days, she was going into the hide. So she just didn't like her hide that I gave her. I thought it looked great. She said, eh, I don't like it. I'm not going to use it. So your snake's behavior will always clue you in as to whether they're happy with their environment. If I've had hiatuses in the hobby. I've had periods where I wasn't keeping snakes. I've had periods where I was keeping a lot more snakes than I do today. Um, but the bottom line is, is that this hobby has been a passion of mine and herping in the wild has been a passion of mine since elementary school. Um, I've learned a lot over the years and through every step in my journey, I've had different mentors who have increased my knowledge. Obviously, when the internet came on, on online, that was huge for the growth of this hobby. We, I remember message boards, and some of you are probably too young, you have no idea what we're talking about, but the chat rooms and the message boards that were reptile specific. I want to say it was kingsnake.com, hosted a bunch of them. Um, Jason and I have shared a similar story where there, for a while in the hobby, not all of my friends loved snakes. Not all of my friends loved reptiles the way I did. Um, you felt a little bit alone at times early in the progression of this hobby's growth. And you didn't realize that there were so many people just like you who had that same passion you did and who were keeping these, you know, what other people consider strange animals. But the amazing thing is, is these message boards and these chat rooms came online and it opened up the entire world of reptile keeping. And suddenly you could go online and you could talk to other people and you could see their picture and you could see pictures of their animals. Back in the dial up internet days, it took forever some, for somebody to upload a picture of one of their snakes, but you got to see other people's collections. You got to see other people's enclosures and it was huge. It, uh, it brought about this wider sense of community that there were a whole bunch of other people in the country who had the same passion you did. And that really fueled my passion again. Um, so my herping experiences and my wild keeping experiences, that led to seeing that there was now this captive bred part of the hobby that was out there. And that, you know, increased my passion even more. And then, like I say, I took a break in the hobby for a few years, but over the last 15 years, it was ramping it up again. Uh, my very first purchase when I started keeping snakes again, California King Snake. I still keep a relatively small collection. I have a permanent collection of seven animals. In addition, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm caring for some of the animals that are part of our, our Herping Quest breed, breeding project of, of Great Basin Gopher Snakes. Uh, I am going to show you my seven. Some people have asked to see my collection. Some of my collection has been in our videos, but I'm always taking them to uh, Jason's place. Um, one thing I just want to say uh, to beginners before I get into the snakes. Pay attention to your snake's behavior. They're telling you whether they're happy or not in their environment. And the last thing I would say to beginners is find your way of doing things. The great thing about the internet is you can be exposed and social media, you can be exposed to a number of opinions and a number of different ways of doing things, but it is perfectly fine to find your own way of keeping. There are many, many right ways to do this, and there are many right ways to keep healthy and happy snakes. There is no one way to do anything in this hobby. So getting to know Jason better over the last few years and he and I deciding to do this YouTube channel, it's, it, you know, it's another big step in the journey and it's reinvigorated my passion for these animals even further. 
uh, and being able to experience Jason's collection and the vastness of it. So I've got seven snakes. Jason has over 500. And getting to see firsthand the breeding side of this hobby, that's been incredibly thrilling for me. So I'm grateful to Jason who, who, who wanted to go on this journey with me on YouTube. And for me to be able to see all the behind the scenes stuff that as customers and consumers we don't always see as you know and going to reptile expos and actually experiencing this hobby from that side of the counter and helping jason sell snakes that's that's been amazing for me and that's something that you know adds an element to my journey so i'm excited about the journey i'm on right now with youtube interacting with all of you that's been amazing please comment please tell us about your own journeys we look forward to hearing about it Thank you.